Um, and so we will be uh, moving along to our next presenter of the morning, uh, Corinne Siska, who is uh, presenting her work exploring local level climate change adaptation in the state of Maine. And her thesis advisor is Richard Norton, or Dick Norton, from uh, both Pite and uh, the School of Architecture and Urban Planning. And her reader is Sarah Mills from the Ford School of Policy. If you'll just excuse me, I have other things to do. Uh, it's no disrespect to the other presenters. Uh, I'd love to stay on, but I have some other things I have to get on with. Well, wonderful. Thank, you. Well, thank you so much for coming and joining us this morning. Excellent. And so Corinne, we'll let you take it away. Okay. <laughs> Hi. For anyone that doesn't know me, my name is Corinne. Um, I'll just jump right into it here. Hopefully everyone can see my screen okay. Um, okay, so my thesis is titled Exploring Local Level Climate Adaptation Planning in the State of Michigan. Before I get into it, I just want to say a quick thank you to my advisor and my reader, Richard Norton and Sarah Mills. Thank you for all of your comments and guidance on my thesis. It was very appreciated. Um, okay, so um, when talking about climate change planning, um, two terms are pretty important to know, mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation policies essentially are those meant to reduce the sources or enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. Essentially, you're trying to lessen the impacts of climate change itself. Adaptation, on the other hand, is adjustment to actual expected climate or its effects. So you're adjusting to the actual realized or anticipated impacts of climate change. So obviously, those two things are both very important, but in current planning efforts, there actually tends to be a greater emphasis often on mitigation as opposed to adaptation and a lot of climate change planning efforts. Um, and that's important to note because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has essentially said that no matter what route of mitigation is taken at this point, um, a certain level of adaptation will be needed. So we are seeing impacts, we're going to see impacts. So focusing on adaptation in the future is going to be important. And so specific to impacts in Michigan, we've already seen a lot of things, you know, increasing temperatures, changes in precipitation, um, the amount of precipitation falling in the heaviest 1% of storms increased by 35%, so an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events. Um, Frost-free season has been extended by 16 days since 1951, so agricultural impacts, potential changes to growing seasons, these are all things that we need to consider. Um, so what has specifically been done at the state level in Michigan for adaptation? Well, in 2009, the state of Michigan passed the Michigan Climate Action Plan, um, and this was largely a mitigation focused plan um, in reference to adaptation. They included the quote, uh, the state of Michigan should undertake a comprehensive planning effort to assess and address the state's vulnerability to climate change and adaptation opportunities. Um, the plan essentially called for the need to plan more on adaptation, um, but as of this thesis, um, no statewide um, adaptation plan has yet been passed. So, a lot of local level communities have taken it upon themselves to start planning for climate change. In fact, both um, in the United States in general and in Michigan, most adaptation efforts to date have taken place at both the local and regional levels. So in Michigan in particular, in a recent survey, 65% um, of jurisdictions indicated that they're involved in some level of sustainability planning. And this is important because these local level jurisdictions have the advantage of a more um, local lens with which to view these issues because the consequences of climate change are gonna be highly dependent on local context and impacts are gonna vary from region to region. So having that local focus um, is important. So knowing all of this, the importance of adaptation, viewing it through a local level, I wanted to look at local level climate adaptation um, in reference to a couple questions. So my first question is how strong or comprehensive are actions being taken by localities in Michigan to adapt to climate change? My second question is, which climate impacts specifically do communities seem to be well prepared for and which do they seem to be neglecting? And then finally, do these first two questions differ significantly across different approaches to planning? So adaptation planning is kind of, a lot of things can go under this umbrella of what is adaptation planning. Um, localities can adopt climate related plans, specifically climate action plans, climate adaptation plans. They can adopt sustainability plans. They can incorporate resiliency planning into their existing documents or master plans. So essentially I wanted to look at things like, are these efforts different between these planning types? Maybe climate plans, 
have a larger focus on mitigation as opposed to adaptation, maybe resiliency planning is more likely to incorporate purely adaptive strategies. So these are the kinds of differences and things that I wanted to look at. So in terms of actual plans that I collected from localities, I relied largely on the Michigan Climate Action Network um, and a list of plans that they included on their website. They are essentially um, a group of some of the most prominent adaptation networks in Michigan. And I divided the, clan, uh, the plans by the categories, as I said earlier. And there was a total of 33 plans. Um, you can see the study sites below, um, distributed pretty well across Michigan, largely from cities. Um, a lot of these efforts are coming out of cities themselves. But I did see four counties, one group of communities around the Lake Superior watershed, um, one island, and one village. Okay, um, and in terms of how I evaluated them, um, I took them largely from uh, this one paper, Seven Principles of Strong Climate Action Planning, um, Clear Goals, Strong Fact Base. These are all very strong principles of these plans. And for diverse strategies and actions, I looked specifically at recommended strategies from um, Woodruff and Stoltz 2016, which basically listed out a bunch of different strategies in relation to different climate impacts like temperature change, increased precipitation, decreased precipitation, um, et cetera. And I won't have the time to talk about every single one of these impacts, but if anyone has any questions over anything that I'm not necessarily going to cover, maybe I can answer questions at the end for you, hopefully. Um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the key, few key results that I had. So results, um, clear goals, um, goal setting, not a huge issue for a lot of these plans, as you can see. In the chart at the top, goals was evaluated in terms of the purpose of the plan. Did they outline a vision for the future? Did they obtain measurable objectives? And then you can see how that's broken down by the individual plan types below. So climate plans in the blue, resilient master plans in the red. Um, and so largely goal setting, not a huge issue. Measurable objectives being found in 91% of the plans. Purpose of the plan being laid out also 91% of the plans, um, not a huge variation between plan types there. Um, and so moving on to diverse strategies and actions, are these plans incorporating a diverse set of strategies to respond to different impacts of climate change? So specifically temperature change here. Uh, there's a lot of strategies here. I know there's a lot going on here. So I wanted to highlight a few categories just to draw your attention to the most commonly used strategies to adapt to these different climate plans that I found. Uh, impacts that I found in the plants, um, with urban and general greening being used in 67% of the plants, improving air quality 76%, and conserving energy in 70%. Um, and I'm not going to include a graph for every single climate impact. I did make a graph. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, but I just wanted to highlight a few of the key results just for the sake of time. Um, but you can see under extreme heat, um, climate action plans more likely to incorporate a broader diversity of strategies to respond to extreme heat as opposed to resilient master plans or sustainability plans. You see more blue spread out throughout the graph um, with a large focus being on expanding urban or general greening to respond to um, an increase in heat. Also energy demand, um, there was a large focus on this in climate action plans and sustainability plans. 100% of plans incorporating measures to conserve energy whereas only a little over of 40% of master planning incorporating measures to do that. Um, so the next um, climate impact that I wanted to talk about was decreased precipitation. Um, and this climate impact category received relatively less attention as opposed to some of the other impacts I'm going to talk about with the most commonly used strategies only showing up in 45% and 42% of the plans respectively. And so, that kind of makes sense, right? Considering that in Michigan, water availability is not necessarily as huge of a concern for us as other places necessarily. Um, but you can see here um, one key result that I found. Um, one trend that I noticed is that master plans tended to have a greater tendency to protect certain natural systems as opposed to some of the other planning documents. So you can see there. Um, protecting and restoring riparian buffers, resilient master plans more likely to include planning in place for those as opposed to some of the other categories. And then increased precipitation, so relatively more attention paid to increased precipitation in Michigan as opposed to decreased. So we're seeing a lot of plans incorporating planning to talk about 
increasing stormwater management capacity. That was super common, 73% of plans. Um, installing green infrastructure in 61% of plans and vegetation for stormwater retention in 70% of plans. So incorporating things like flooding protection, stormwater management capacity, super common um, strategies being incorporated to respond to this. Um, and in terms of flooding, um, I included this graph to talk about an earlier point that I brought up about maybe climate plans have a greater focus on mitigative efforts and maybe resilient or master plans have a greater focus on more purely adaptive strategies. And so flooding protections, I consider to be more adaptive, doesn't really mitigate any impacts of climate. And so you can see here that resilient and our resilient master plans and sustainability plans generally more commonly reference things for flooding protections like increasing stormwater management capacity, low impact development, capturing stormwater than climate plans. And then finally, uh, the last extreme event that I want to talk about, or the last climate impact that I want to talk about, extreme events. Um, the most commonly used strategies here um, are renewable energy for backup power or restoring wetlands and dunes used by 79% of the plans and 64% of the plans um, with more explicit strategies like installing floodgates or strengthening physical infrastructure not being found in, in any of the plans. Um, another thing to note here, I talked earlier about natural systems um, when it comes to restoring wetlands or dunes to prevent risk of more erosion in the event of more extreme events. Um, master plans way more likely than climate plans to talk about that with sustainability plans being maybe somewhere in the middle, almost 70%. Um, and finally, like I said, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of the climate principles, but I really wanted to highlight the last one. Um, incorporating mechanisms for implementation and monitoring of these plans. This is really important um, because it's a, great to have a lot of this stuff on paper, but being able to implement it is important. And this category I actually found was somewhat lacking. So the majority of plans did include a timeline, 55%, but less than half talked about things like funding sources or amounts, um, responsible organizations and parties that didn't identify those as often, or uh, monitoring of progress. And so what does all of this mean? Um, I'm gonna talk about them in reference to my different discussion questions that I mentioned earlier. So the first one being, how strong or comprehensive are actions being taken by localities in Michigan to adapt to climate change? So a huge strength, like I said earlier, is goal setting. Um, having these plans in place, um, laying out these different strategies is not necessarily a weakness. Plans that are currently um, in place do that very, very well. I think a notable weakness that I want to highlight, though, is the implementation of these goals. So how much is this going to cost? Who's going to do it? Over what time is it going to be done? Things like that. These are questions that are more lacking. Um, my second question, so which impacts do communities seem to be well prepared for and which do they seem to be neglecting? So in reference to increased temperature, these plans incorporate the consistent use of a few specific strategies, things like expanding urban greening but they need to incorporate more diverse strategies to address this issue. So things like opening additional cooling centers, maybe monitoring increase in vector-borne diseases, all of those different strategies that I looked at were found less frequently in the plans. Um, changing precipitation, so more attention was paid to increase precipitation as opposed to decrease precipitation. And so while um, overall precipitation in the Great Lakes region is expected to increase, um, that's not necessarily going to be true depending on each locality. Some places might see an increase, some places might see a decrease, um, and summers overall are expected to be drier. So having some level of planning in place for decreased precipitation um, is still appropriate. And then extreme events. Um, I, I think more attention should be paid to more explicit adaptation strategies other than things like expanding renewable energy. I mean, it's great that places are doing that, but I think things like installing floodgates or other structural protections, relocating vulnerable infrastructure, these are things that didn't receive a lot of attention that could receive attention in the future. Um, and finally, how these questions differ across the different types of planning. So I did notice a trend that climate plans tended to have a greater emphasis on mitigation as opposed to adaptation or a lot of the adaptive strategies that they're incorporating could be considered both mitigative and adaptive. So expanding urban greening, reducing energy demand, reducing water demand, things like that. Whereas resilient master plans and also sustainability plans, more likely to reference more purely adaptive strategies, you know, 
um, protecting natural systems, flooding protections, et cetera. But there's still substantial overlap between these planning types and the content that they covered. So adaptation can be incorporated in different ways into these different plans with largely similar results, but there are a few distinctions that I wanted to highlight there. And so wrapping up, um, this study provided insight into how Michigan communities are approaching adaptation. This is still an emerging field. Um, there's roughly 1,800 local jurisdictions in Michigan, and I was able to find 33 plans. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Moving forward, I think um, communities that want to adopt adaptation plans, they should continue to establish clear goals and pay attention to things like increased precipitation and temperature. But um, the way future efforts can be improved moving forward, I would recommend more implementation and planning, a use of more diverse strategies to respond to specific impacts, and also more attention to specifically decreased precipitation and an increase in extreme events. And that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Corinne. That was an excellent presentation. Um, we have some time for a couple of questions. And again, you can either unmute your microphone or uh, type your question into the chat. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> I have a question again, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, Corinne, great job. It's great to see you again. Um, uh, quick question. I noticed that in your map that a large number of the cities um, were located on the coast. Did you notice a difference between uh, the interior cities and the exterior cities in terms of the number of them that had resiliency plans? Because it would make sense to me that if they were uh, coastal, they'd be a lot more concerned about uh, resiliency plans or adaptation in terms of rising uh, sea levels and um, you know, ser more serious you know, issues with their infrastructure located along the coast. Um, did you notice a difference in that by any chance? Yeah, so um, I know that actually um, 16 of my 33 plans were found along coastal communities. So that's a pretty good um, amount of my plans. And so I think being on the coast does provide more, um, I guess, motive to plan for these kind of things. Um, I didn't include coastal resiliency plans as a specific category in the plans that I evaluated. But I did collect a few of them and they were included in the total, which was the purple bars on the graphs. So I definitely noticed um, that they were more likely to engage in planning. But things like relocating vulnerable infrastructure or strengthening physical infrastructure, um, those percentages were still included in the, in the totals um, of the graphs. And so they were still kind of low. So I think that there is planning in place for that in these communities, but it's not necessarily um, as comprehensive as you might hope. Thanks. Yeah. And I'll call your attention to uh, a question that's in the chat from Sarah Mills. Um, and so uh, she's asking for communities that haven't planned for climate yet, would your research suggest it makes sense to put these in climate plans, the master plan or the sustainability? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so like I said, there is a large amount of overlap in the content that is covered in these different kinds of plans. Um, specifically what works for a community might depend on local context. So um, another category that I looked at that I didn't necessarily talk about in my presentation, but that I included in the thesis was the use of empirical data. And I found that climate plans were much more likely to include the use of empirical data with things like vulnerability assessments. Um, and so that might suggest that maybe to adopt a climate plan, you have the resources for that kind of stuff. Maybe it's more, I guess, um, resource effective if you incorporate resiliency planning into existing documents like master plans. Um, maybe depending on local context, um, in a lit review that I did, I found papers that said framing things in terms of climate change can either be a motivator for this kind of action or it can be a deterrent depending on um, the local community. So maybe you want to label it as sustainability planning or resiliency planning if you don't think climate change is going to be as much of a buzzword. Um, so I don't want to give a general answer for one being better than the other. I think it could depend on a lot of things. Hey, Corinne, it, <coughs> Corinne um, I'll follow up on Sarah's question. Um, first of all, I'll just, for everybody to know, your thesis is very well written and executed. It was a really mm -hmm. nice piece of yeah. work. Um, and the question I have kind of builds on what Sarah asked, and it's a little bit pushing you beyond where you, what you set out to do, but um, I'm wondering if, in, as you read all of the plans, how many of the plans that were maybe billing itself as a resilience plan was citing to other efforts the community was doing through other planning documents. So in other words, 
instead of thinking about what's the right kind of plan to adopt to do this, maybe there are, there are different things to do and different plans that when you integrate them together would help a community be more adaptive and resilient than trying to do it all in one plan. And as you were reviewing the documents, did you see any evidence that any of the communities were thinking that way or were they, did it look like they were trying to do everything in the one kind of plan that they were adopting? Um, I think that that's would be a really great strategy moving forward. Largely, I noticed that if I collected one plan, whether it was a climate plan or a resilient master plan for one community, that was generally the only plan that I was able to get from that community and generally the only kind of effort that was referenced. So it seems like as of right now, this field is still kind of in its infancy in that if a locality has a plan, it's generally limited to one type of planning. But like you said, I think it would make a lot of sense to incorporate um, different kinds of planning um, rather than just focusing on one in the future. Yeah, okay, interesting. It's, your results are, <laughs> are not surprising in the sense that they really well characterize what I would have expected to hear about what the state of Michigan planning. So they're, so they're robust that way. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Well, great job, Corinne, very nicely presented. Um, I will call everyone's uh, attention to a comment that Stacy Coyle uh, placed in um, with respect to um, some of this work. Um, and so with that, thank you very much for presenting your work. We virtually applaud you um, and, and very nicely done.